My name is Vince. For as long as I can remember, I've had a fascination with the mysteries of the world. When I was four years old, I woke up to a noise in my room. I looked up and saw a large-headed, blue boy standing by my bed. It has haunted me ever since. But now I'm a man. A man dedicated to finding the truth. My name is Alex. My fascination with the occult began when I saw a vision of the Virgin Mary when I was five years old. And it's only gotten weirder since then. When I visited Sedona, Arizona, I had an awakening. As the vortex opened, so did my mind. Now I'm dedicated to unearthing the mysteries of my home, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'm Alex. I'm one of your hosts for Pacific North Weird, and today we're going to Mima Mounds. Geological specialists don't understand. It doesn't seem natural because it's they're so even and evenly spaced. Uh, there's a lot of theories about what caused them. Some people think that they're some sort of ancient Native American construction, but there's no real uh, explanation for why they were made, is there's nothing inside of them. They're just these heaps of dirt. Uh, so it makes this very strange, surreal setting. Gosh, some people think they're made by gophers. They exist in a couple places in the U.S., but I believe the ones, they were named after the ones in Washington. What type of mysteries are you expecting to solve today, Alex? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I'm sure we'll find out. Sure, let's just figure out. We'll, we'll solve this whole thing today. Nobody's been able to figure it out yet, but I think we can. I'm excited to solve some mysteries, or not solve them. I I'm, would be okay if we just sucked up the mystery. Do you have any previous experiences with Mima Mounds? I've been there once. I did think I saw a UFO there last time, but it turns out it was just a glider. But for 10 seconds, it was pretty cool. Bing! <laughs> um, so, do you know about some of the theories about what's caused the Mima Mounds to form? Um, a little bit. Uh, Mima Mounds, uh, my favorite theory is that there's giant prehistoric gophers that, um, I guess, formed a commune and decided to make all their homes in nice little rows all across this area of Washington State. Glacial um, anomalies, uh, the parts of the continent being scrunched together so it almost like uh, their lesions on on the face of planet okay. Earth. I like that There's one. Herpes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mima Mounds. We're about to visit the herpes of Washington State. <laughs> I'm eager to go there and just kind of uh, take the place in, kind of get a feel for it. Uh, uh, it's a uh, geographic anomaly that apparently exists on all of the Earth's continents except for Antarctica. That we know of. I mean, Antarctica's covered in a lot of ice and who the hell knows what's out there. But we're not in Antarctica. We're in uh, North America, Washington State. We're going to be going about 15 miles south of here down Little Rock Road to Mima Mounds. You 
guys are not. Did you take a class in physical geography and you guys are doing Yeah, we've made it, and we are right in the midst of Mima Mounds right now, and well, it's pretty moundy. We are venturing on top of one of the Mima Mounds right now. I'm on top of a mound. Look around you. I think if you talk to them and they do a little study, it isn't something you come on to and just say, oh, I know all about that. You know, uh, and that's the goal of our show, to take the things that people see yeah. as weird and try to um, shed some more light. I'm not going to label the, the, uh, what I see as natural as weird. I'm not trying to be argumentative now, but I'm trying to help you. But don't label the Mima Mounds as weird. They're interesting. Okay. Mima Mounds Yelp Reviews. Been here twice now. And each time I'm left wondering, how did those mounds form? Cute little park to walk around and learn about the mounds, but it's more like 30 minute stopping point, not a place you could spend a whole day. The shooting from the range is a tad annoying too. This place is just serenity, just so quiet and peaceful, perfect, perfect trails and the wonderment that are the mounds. There's a little education center to tell you how the mounds were formed by water, and it's actually quite amazing to see what nature can do. And there are just so many mounds. You have to have a discovery pass, and there isn't a place to pay per use. This truly is an escape, though. Leave your troubles behind. Don't take your cell phone or any electronics. Turn off the radio, and just be at peace. True, you do hear gunfire from the hunting club, but honestly, it didn't bother me. It was kind of a very small drop of water in a super huge pond. Boop! I will definitely be going back again, and will be sure to get a discovery pass. Pacific North Wind! Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza. And I'm Alexandra Sullivan. And we have with us Deston Lay Deniston, who is a prairie science technician at the Mima Mounds. Indeed. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Uh, to start with, we are drinking a uh, Yakima Valley Washington red wine called Sasquatch in a Bottle. Cheers. Cheers. Oh. Delicious. I don't believe in it either. It smells and tastes better yeah, than any Sasquatch I've ever met. That's what I was thinking. Well, they didn't use a skunk grape for it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, Destin, tell us, uh, what do you do at the Mima Mounds? I, well, it's one of the many sites that I work on in the Southwest Washington Prairies. Um, I'm actually all the way from Joint Base Lewis McCord and then down to the Little Rock area, there's a series of prairies that a uh, nonprofit that I work with uh, manages. And specifically at the Mima Mountains this year, we have done a lot of monitoring of 
fire sites that have been ignited over the past two to three years. And the monitoring that we do is to go in and count the plants that are regenerating in areas that we haven't replanted, and then to count the plants that are in areas that we have replanted, and then to count the plants in areas that we have replanted and are doing control of non-native species. Um, and then we compare those and we look at them and we say, well, based on the kind of prairie that we want to end up with, what should we be doing? And burning those prairies and then replanting them is part of the process of getting a prairie that uh, I suppose a lot of different agencies and people have stakeholdership in. This is North Weird! Some people theorize that these mounds are evidence of extraterrestrial interference, that perhaps these are uh, small landing pads for UFOs or black triangles, uh, discs. That supernatural phenomenon uh, is abundant in these areas, and perhaps areas like this around the world. I hear gunshots in the background. You may see them as just a bunch of rednecks, but perhaps what you're really hearing is the first line of defense separating us and our extraterrestrial overlords. There actually was floated for a while a giant gopher theory. Um, and, you know, the, the idea came out of this notion that there's a lot of... Uh, kinds of families of animals that have replicate animals in different sizes. Yeah. So it's like you've got, you know, brown bears and grizzly bears. You've got ducks and you've got geese, you know. Um, so the idea is that there used to be giant gophers. And somebody floated this, I don't know, it was maybe in the 20s or 30s. Um, but no archaeological evidence has ever showed up. Or I, not archaeological, but uh, bone evidence. They haven't found any fossils out there that suggest that there were, you know, seven foot long gophers out there digging and making these mounds. Hi, my name is Brian, and uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the story of uh, my mounds here in uh, Washington State. And um, I want to first thank my, my buddy Mark for sharing this story with me and the Chehalis people for, for the story. And so it starts in a long time ago when the animals were, they ruled the world. And during that time there was a great flood. And the humans were looking for land and they were in their canoes and they were out on, on the water and they couldn't find any land so they needed help so they asked Muskrat. And muskrat said, yes, I'll help you. Who was Muskrat? Muskrat was part of the, uh, the animal nation. And uh, Muskrat was all over the land. And uh, so the humans saw Muskrat and they said, we'll ask Muskrat for help. He dove from the little piece of land he had into the water and started digging and digging and digging. And, you know, Muskrat, how Muskrat is. They pushed that dirt up and it started coming through the water and coming through all things. And they started building all these where we have the mounds uh, today all there but he got down and as he was digging he saw the, uh, his, his fellow relatives down in the corpus and then they were so happy that what he was doing that they started jumping up and down and as he was digging they were jumping up and down and they were pushing and pushing and pushing and that's how the hills they made those, those hills the, the mounds and so to this day that's those, those mounds are, are there and visible and uh, they're kind uh, some people call it muskrat mount, mountains. Some people call it candy, candy rock mountains. Um, so it's all it's all connected in that story. So so muskrat by digging up the earth created the actual mounds, but the porpoises by jumping created the prairie land around the mounds. Yeah, they did. They were able to push it up and up and make that rolling. It's like a rolling wave. Um, muskrat seems like a pretty cool dude. Yeah, he was. Muskrat. Muskrat. If you look throughout the, uh, the stories across uh, Turtle Island, uh, America, um, you'll you'll notice that muskrat was uh, a part of a lot of those stories. Was uh, muskrat 
involved in uh, other forms of real estate development throughout Turtle Island? Yeah, yeah. He he helped uh, a lot of different nations. Uh, there's some stories out there. So right now they're talking about this whole notion that there's two uh, kinds of theories out there, and you know this idea of a theory is like, okay, here's a th here's an idea about how this happened. Let's look for evidence that supports this idea and figure out if that evidence actually lines up to show a direct causality. Um, and right now, one of the theories that's being floated around is this idea that our current gophers on the prairies, the Mazama pocket gopher, which is an endangered species, um, is it turns out it's starting to look like mounds are relatively perfect size for a pocket gopher col colony. And so there's people out there who are suggesting, you know, maybe the pocket gophers are building these mounds up by excavating soil from deep in the ground, tilling it constantly, creating the different texture of soil in the mound then below. Of course, defecating into it. Plants are growing onto it, so it becomes richer because of the uh, process of decomposition of the plants on the mounds. And the, this is potentially one theory about how the mounds have appeared. Another theory um, that gets spoken about for these mounds, because there are Mima mounds actually in other parts of the world. Yes. Um, and some of them may have been very, created in very different ways, which is one of the interesting things. You end up with a like phenomena that was created in a completely different manner of, you know, natural ex energy exchanges. And, but as the glacier recedes, you can imagine, like, you've got this huge sheet of ice that's thousands of feet thick, you know, over a mile in many places. And at the receding lip of this glacier, as it's pulling back across the landscape, as it's gone forward, it's scraped everything, and of course the weight of the glacier is grinding and crushing everything underneath it. Mm -hmm. And what you basically get is bedrock and clay is what's left down at the bottom. Now the glacier is moving forward and it's scraping all of these rocks along its path. These rocks are rolling along its path. And then as the climate begins to warm up, these rocks collect heat on top of the glacier where they're resting. Where they're collecting heat, it's melting underneath the glacier, right? Well, there's also dusts and sediments that are on top of the glacier as this happens. And if you've gone out uh, and done any hiking on the local mountains that have glaciers, you'll find that there are these kind of like waving ribbony bands at times of the year where dust and sediment have collected on the glacier surface. And one of the ideas suggests that as the glacier is receding, these dusty bands are also collecting heat. Now, if you've got a glacier that's miles and miles and miles wide, these dusty bands could, instead of being these two to three foot dusty bands that I'm familiar with up on uh, Mount Rainier that I've seen, or Mount St. Helens, you've got miles and miles wide and these bands collect heat and they start rolling into these holes that melt underneath them. And as the pockets form, they then go through the pocket and land on the ground as lumps between the fingers of the glacier as it recedes. Oh, that's really and interesting. The, this theory is, I, I think, one of our better notions about how the Mima Mounds were laid down. And if you look at aerial views, there are several places where you can see this kind of sinuous pattern of straight lines, not straight lines, but of relationships of curved lines in the mountains. It's a current. And it's like a very slow motion current depositing these lumps that melt through the leading, or I should say the receding edge of the glacier. And so I think there's a lot of credence to that theory. Do we have enough information to say, that's it, verified fact? No, we don't. But right now, to me, from my mind, it's looking like the gophers adapted to that pattern 
and that the reason their colonies are that size is because it's a pain in the ass to dig through the rocks that those nice lofted soil mounds are on top of. Now you add the burning to that, and when you burn over the top of that, that collects even more organic matter, it has more nutrients in it, and that environment becomes richer and richer. graveyard for the fallen wolves that had made their home here. As you can see, they've taken the natural landscape of the mound and turned this into the final resting place for so many of these noble beasts. You can see the names of all the wolves who've lived here over the All wolves know the price that must be paid before they are to enter the mounds. When you see a wolf in howling mode like that, they are actually performing oral sex upon a ghost, a phantom gatekeeper, a uh, administer between the haven and the after haven. All wolves must pass. It is a price that must be paid, a feral tithe, before they are to rest and howl in eternity amongst the Mima Mounds. Um, most of Lacey actually used to be on prairie. Um, and of course when people move to an area and they look at something, it's like, in the Pacific Northwest, you probably find more people who are willing to live in a dense thicket of trees, but pretty much everywhere I've been, people like to have a view. Well, that makes the prairie a high commodity thing. Now you put a thousand houses in there that all want a view. We all want to see Mount St. Helens, so we're all going to pick this slope. And pretty soon the prairie's buried underneath houses and pavement. Yeah. And there's no prairie there anymore. So we have Lakewood, we have Yelm, and it wasn't that the native populations here, the tribes had towns, they had verifiable cities with you know, tens of thousands of people moving in and out of a given location. Um, but, and, and like I said, they had trade and they had agriculture, but what they didn't have was pavement and automobiles, etc. And you know, automobiles take up roughly 40% of our urban environment is dedicated to the automobile. It's like, we live in a city, 40% of that city is dedicated to a tool that you use on average less than two hours a day. You use it less than you use your TV, but 40% of our city is dedicated to it. So this is what broke the prairie system up. And now we get to this interesting thing. Um, the prairies like fire. So some of our best, our best, our best prairie habits. Ha God, the wine is <laughs> fine. God damn. Good job, Yakima. I, I usually, I usually go straight to it and have like three or four shots of bourbon when I end my day. I'm like half a glass into this wine and I'm doing great. <laughs> Mama Mounds Yelp Reviews
the gunfire you hear is not part of the experience. Well, it has been part of the experience the two times I've been here, which is exactly one time too many. I am not a Mima Mounds lover. Let me rewind. Mima Mounds should have it all. Interesting history with a bit of mystery thrown in. Unusual physical features. Convenient parking. Well maintained. Tons of information on the web describe the uniqueness of this area. And eventually the road you take might drive right past. Give yourself ten minutes to soak it all in. That should do it. As you can see on the map, it's right next to a gun range. And the experience felt more like WW2 than a nature walk. <laughs> I hear that if you walk further to the furthest reaches of the preserve, the sound of gunfire goes away. We never found out. My mound looks great on paper. I'm glad it exists and is preserved, but it's hard to contemplate the glacial floods that created this place amid the constant sounds of gunfire. Read the Wikipedia page, the articles from Sea Times, and then decide. You've been warned. World War III! An absolutely beautiful natural area with the sounds of gunfire in the background. Now, I'm not against guns or legally firing them, but a firing range that close to the natural preserve completely ruins the experience. Aside from the gunfire, the mysterious mounds are very interesting and beautiful. They're covered with a variety of wildflowers. You see little furry animals running around. Or running for cover from bullets. <laughs> Overall, it is a very pretty and interesting area. Just bring earplugs or an iPod to drown out the sounds. Truck boat. So you still have fun with it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's a great place, isn't it? They're fantastic. They're, and, I, and I've been here my whole life. You know, it's the first time I saw the Mima Mounds, I was probably like 12 years old. So it's been 30 years now that I've been aware of them and they still like bring me giggles. Yeah. So. Nice. What's, um, what's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you on the Mima Mounds Prairie? Actually, like, when I look at my mounds, the thing that I want to do is I want to have, like, this thing that's kind of like a tree fort, but it would have to have, like, really, it, it would all be built out of wood except for the frame of it. I've imagined this thing, and it would have these very large overinflated tires so they didn't disturb the soil very much, and then on top of it would be a ship. And it would be like set so that it was just like six feet high, so that I could go crawling between the mounds, and it would look like a ship was sailing through the miles. Oh yeah! And so like I have this like, it, it, in my mind it looks very much like one of those, um, what are the, the the collage cartoons that are done in mm -hmm. the Monty Python skits? Yeah, yeah. and that's what like, I see. Like a Terry Gilliam yes, animation. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and just like I have like my weird little like boat on wheels like <laughs> tottering amazing. through the miles. <laughs>
Hey, uh, we are at Little Rock's Music on the Mounds Festival, right by the Mima Mounds themselves. This is Dinah Sayers. May I say that correctly? Yes, you did. Hey, uh, how's it going? It's going really great. So, uh, tell us about the Music on the Mounds Festival. <laughs> okay, so Music on the Mounds is, we consider it a music co-op, which really means that all of us are putting our money in the pot to pay the fantastic musicians who are willing to come out and play for us. So, this year we've had about um, a concert a month. Some really great talent has been here, and we could like to call it a small venue with huge talent. And um, tonight we're doing a really great show with the Lois Pair and McDougal. Cool. Uh, how long have you been doing this? Last year was our first year, so this concert is concert number 11. 11 of all time. Yes, 11 of all time, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so we're really brand new. We're still trying to build our audience and um, find the right people that enjoy live music on a small scale and enjoy being able to stay and camp after the show. Um, we always want people to be safe. And um, so we're trying to get the word out there to find the right crowd so that we always have a full barn for every musician that's here. Do you... Uh have any uh, thing planned for the future? Yes, as a matter of fact, besides t tonight's show, we have a show on August 16th with a band called the Hooten Hollers all the way from Missouri. Um, they are just incredible, incredible musicians. And on September 13th, we have the biggest show we have ever done on the mounds and um, really just a huge project for us, the Fluff and Gravy Festival, which will be 10 or 11 bands, music from 12 noon to 12 midnight, um, food vendors, craft vendors and a ton of talent off of the fluff and gravy record label so that's september 13th and we're really looking forward to that show a bunch cool yeah this is a really beautiful atmosphere you've got going here like it, it feels comfortable i really like it excellent we do try to have people feel like it's home and it's part of why we like to do this sharing our beautiful property and opening up our barn to um, you know facilitate musicians and fans coming together in a way that they might not get to at another venue we think um, we really do create fans for life here and I think musicians appreciate that connection with the fans that they get at a small venue like this <laughs> So you do live here right next to the mounds, which are over here, correct? Yes, yes. Our property is surrounded on two sides by the Mima Mounds Natural Area Preserve. It's absolutely beautiful. We like to think that it's kind of like living on the water because there's such an incredible change of light and grasses and flowers. And we have actually chosen to leave our entire 10 acres of property as natural as possible. So our yard incorporates the mounds. We let all the native wildflowers grow. Um, we really kind of even try to go around them with our lawnmowers. And um, we let the, um, the Gary Oaks continue to grow here. So it's, it's, we try to leave it as natural as possible because we love the habitat and we love the Mima Mounds Prairie. And so we feel like it's beautiful on its own. And what's the strangest thing you've ever seen out here? <laughs> okay, so the strangest thing is um, we had a show on April 26th, and our opening musician, Joe McMurrian, fantastic musician, came from Portland to play, and he and his he and um, he was sitting in his car over on the other side of this little shed behind us, and. I walked up to him to say, great show, and there he was with his mouth hanging open saying, oh my God, we saw this incredible light just go over the tops of the mounds and uh, over the tops of the trees. And I was talked to him a little bit about, well, could it have been the porch light or the, no, it was something really amazing. And so he and um, the person that saw it with him were just lit up. They just, they thought it was incredible, great energy and this wonderful, you know, light and um, just really thought it was cool. So, you know, I guess that's the, the weirdest thing lately. 
Great. Yeah. Well, excellent. I think this is great too. And uh, I'll leave you with uh, one more question. What is your favorite thing about living next to the Mima Mounds? Oh, the, my favorite thing is the privacy. We live at the end of a long um, gravel driveway, and because we're surrounded on two sides by the Mima Mounds Prairie, the chances of having neighbors at any time in the future is very slim. So I enjoy the privacy. I don't have any curtains. I don't hope to have curtains in the future. And you know, we sometimes tease about, oh, sorry about the condos out, you know, on, that are so close but it's really great to have all this privacy and, and enjoy it without um, any interruption. It's almost like you're living in the very last vestige of, of privacy here. Well, thank you, Dinah, very much. Thank you. And uh, stay tuned for some music. found this secret little spot of the Mima Mounds Prairie Preserve on the other side of this fence from the Music on the Mounds Festival. And I have to say out of the three weeks that I've been working on this video project, this right here is the most perfect view of Mima Mounds I've yet to see. This is serene. It's beautiful. It's weird. It's exactly it's exactly why people come out here to look at this. You don't get this type of experience from the actual park, from the actual visitor's area. I kind of want to be out here my whole life now. Look at it. Well, see, the thing is, is because I had a head injury while I was in the Army, and my head injury allowed, I had a crack in my sinus and I was, when I woke up in the hospital, I asked the doctor about the sweet taste in my mouth. It was like, I have this metallic sweet flavor in my mouth. What is that? I thought they'd given me some kind of treatment. He's like, well, the truth is, is you've ruptured your arachnoid process and what you're tasting are cerebral spinal fluids. And... Whoa. So the deal is, is like, I've already eaten my own brain and I'm immune to zombies. When the apocalypse comes, I'm your man. Like, they can bite me, but it's like, you know, they can't really take me down. I won't turn into a zombie. I don't get the fever because I already ate my own brain. Yeah, you have like immunity. Uh -huh. You have like a get out of jail free. It's part. like I have diplomatic immunity against the undead. That's pretty groovy, dude. So. Awesome. In closing. Cool. Uh, well, best on. Uh, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you very much. Great. Right. Um, and we all had a, a rousing conversation there. I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I implore you all to uh, listen to what the mounds have to tell you. Do not be afraid of your secrets. The mounds do not judge. As you inhale, they exhale. Imagine 
a single mound on your tongue. Now imagine you have a tongue for every mound. Mama Mounds Yelp Reviews This is a nice and relaxing spot to visit that is located right outside Olympia, Washington. My hubby and I stopped by after visiting my sister and we were the only ones there. It was a Monday morning, so no shocker there, but it was a bit spooky. Foggy and cold. Felt like a scene out of twilight. It's a really easy walk and will only take about 20 minutes tops. The mounds are really cool. Apparently no one knows why they're there, so it's interesting. The scenery is pretty and the Mima Mounds provided a quick, easy workout. Visit, won't you? And that's what we found out about the Mima Mounds. Join us again next time on Pacific North Weird when we go on another wild and wacky adventure in the Northwest. I hear next time Vince gets pregnant. Gosh, Alex, I'm really looking forward to that episode. So am I. Wait, what's that over there? Why, it's Alan Stover playing his song Beautiful Unknown about the Mima Mounds. Holy Tanino.
do, but I saw the wolf man acting like a fool at the mama mouth. Mama 